Good morning and welcome to the May edition of MyTechU where we're going to be talking about optimizing your workflow with Outlook and Word. Um, we are fortunate to have Ben Moyer do a encore performance from his presentation that he completed at Tech Pulse that happened on April 30th uh, this year. Uh, what, one of the things we've found over the years through our newsletter articles that we distribute to our customers and prospects and even the attendance to the presentation at Tech Pulse is that whenever we talk about email management or tips and tricks around Word or Outlook, it seems to be the, one of the most popular topics uh, because everyone seems to be frustrated and have challenges with um, effectively managing their email um, and then being able to use some of the simple tricks that uh, Microsoft has actually built into um, key programs. So what uh, we want to tee off today is that, uh, Ben, this is not necessarily for those of you who feel that you are Outlook or Word power users. Um, this is this, so a lot of these. If you if you feel you're an Outlook power user or, or a Word power user, this is really not the presentation for you. Uh, I don't want you to be frustrated at the end that uh, you didn't learn anything new if you already knew all this stuff. But this is definitely some uh, some common tips and tricks that uh, Ben will be able to you know guide us through that can hopefully help you in your efficiency with uh, managing and uh, your email and using Outlook and Word. So with that said, Ben, uh, take it away and look forward to uh, hearing your presentation. All right, thank you. Uh, welcome. Um, like uh, Nathan said, uh, this is really um, a quick um, overview on a lot of topics. Uh, typically, um, this is about a two-hour class that I do, and we're going to jam this into 45 minutes, so I am going to go quick. Um, and uh, anything that you hear today, uh, you can search for uh, in Outlook um, help or Word help, and you'll be able to find uh, the exact things on how to use that using the F1 key or just clicking the question mark in the, the tab. I'll show you how to do that. Um, like I said, uh, my name is Ben Moyer, and uh, I'm with My Tech Partners. Uh, only been here for a uh, couple of weeks, but I'm enjoying my time here uh, uh, very much. So we're going to go through, and uh, I'm going to go through the agenda here. Um, we're going to do uh, some things in Outlook, views, to-do bar, favorites, shared calendar, search folders, advanced find. Uh, the advanced find is a great tool for looking for things. Show you how to use uh, signatures in an efficient way, some rules out of office, and then we'll tie the rules into out of office and show you how to do some cool things there. Uh, we're going to jump into Word very quickly and show you some very uh, basic uh, uh, formatting uh, rules that or ideas that will help you uh, format your documents. Um, we'll end the, uh, the, the um, webinar here with some questions and answers, and uh, I think we're going to get some questions and answers throughout the, uh, the webinar as well, so we'll uh, definitely do that. So I'm going to hop right into it. Um, give me a second here as I pull up my... Okay, so you should be able to see my uh, inbox here. Um, I am going to uh, first start with views. Uh, a lot of people, um, when they're working within Outlook, will um, just use their standard boxes to organize everything. So as you can see here, if I go pre previous to 2008, you'll see that I had folders uh, structured for everybody that I could possibly think of, sorted by customer. Um, and sort of by company, and as you can see, it was if I were trying to organize something, um, something could be in a folder, and I could drag it into one of these folders and misplace it. So if I wanted to put this into Jenny Nelson, but I hit the LBM journal, um, I would be have a difficult time finding it, and then I would end up doing an advanced find to go find that anyways. So what I found is that having lots of folders actually impedes my progress in, in efficiency in working with, uh, with Outlook. So what I've done is I've kind of gotten rid of them, and you'll see that I only have a couple of folders now. I've got a Synergy folder, a Personal folder, a My Tech folder, and my Inbox. And that's really all the folders I have. And what I've done is I will use Views in, if I'm looking for something. So if I go over here to the Synergy folder, and you'll see I've just got a ton of email in here. I've got about 30,000 messages in here. And looking for something would be very, very difficult. But if I go over to my view here, 
and um, go to Change View and Manage Views, I can actually create a new view. So I'm going to go here and make uh, on this folder. And I'm going to put a filter in here. And I'm going to say where this is from Gerald Holland. And I'm going to rename that to Gerald. Gerald is our chief engineer, and I speak to him often. So now I can go up here and change that view to Gerald. And what it's going to do is it's going to show me every email here that has to do with Gerald. So now if I'm looking for an email and I'm working with Gerald, I don't have to put it in a Gerald folder. I can just go up here and change my view to Gerald. And I can go back to the Send To view, which is the standard view, and I can find everything. But as you can see, this just pops it up quick. I can find everything that has to do with Gerald in the Synergy folder. Because that folder is available, I can also come to the My Text view and send to the Gerald as well. So I can use the view and cross it with different folders. So it's very, um, very easy to uh, find things that I'm looking for. Just remember, if you're going to apply a view something, turn it off because um, if you go to the standard, if you go to the standard view, um, you'll definitely need to make sure that you change it back so that you don't end up. Um, thinking that the only mail that's in the Synergy folder is from Gerald. I've, I've made that mistake in the past. I'm like, where is this? So it's best to just get that set, set back to the original view, which is the Send to view. So that's views. Um, just a quick way to be able to look for something. It works in some cases. I don't recommend creating a view for everybody you work with. The views are so easy to make and delete. I can just delete that really quick. Um, it's just a quick way to manage it. So, um, so that's what kind of wanted to show that to you. The second thing we're going to talk about is the to-do bar. Um, when I've got something in my inbox and I need to schedule a meeting, I can literally drag it over and drop it on a day, and it creates the appointment for, for me. So that paused. So you'll see this now that I just added this to an appointment. You'll see that I can add this here, and now I can change the date and time. So I can set an appointment very easily by just dragging something onto the clock. Uh, onto the date of the calendar here. So I just wanted to show you that. The other thing, you can also drag it into your tasks area and create a task for follow-up. It's just a really quick way of uh, setting appointments and reminders. Uh, on my calendar, um, I tend to create events that way so that I can remember to follow up with somebody at a specific time. Um, it's just a great way to um, manage your time. Um, I'm going to show you favorites. As you can see here, um, I've got the Inbox, Synergy, My Tech, and Personal. Those are my favorite folders. Um, all you have to do is if you have a folder somewhere that you're working, so maybe I'm working on a sales uh, issue and I've got a subfolder a little bit deep, I can just click on this, show it in favorites, and now it's one of the folders that I can work with. It's a quick way to drop a folder into here, a file or an email into that folder, and uh, and get that accomplished. Um, the uh, but when I'm done with it, I can just remove the uh, the favorite and get it out of my way so it's not in my way. I've had one person actually expand all their folders and move them all into favorites. Well, that doesn't accomplish anything. What you're looking to do is move the favorites up for the things you're working for for that day, then remove them when you're not using them so that they don't get in your way, so that your case, your chances of dropping it into the wrong folder uh, doesn't happen. Um, the next thing I'm going to show you is shared calendaring. Um, when I go into the calendaring, you'll see that I've got uh, two calendars that I've used in the past here. I've got a wild calendar plus my own, and then I've got some shared calendars with some people that I work with on a regular basis. The reason that I might build uh, two separate calendars and, and, um, is not because I want to try to track um, my time on two different calendars, but I might have something that I want to be aware of, but I don't want it to impact my daily schedule. So. A perfect example is I had season tickets to the Wild, and I wanted to know when the games were being played, but I didn't really want them on my primary calendar in case somebody wanted to schedule me. I didn't want it taking up time. 
and so, and I also didn't want other people to see when my wild games were, so I just moved that onto a separate calendar. And if I wanted to go to that game, I would just literally click on it and drag it over onto my calendar, and then it would be on my calendar, um, and then I would also still have it to show when I had tickets come. I also, as you can see here, I sold a lot of my tickets too, so you can see that I've actually uh, kept track that way. So it's just a great way to keep track. Uh, somebody might have a personal calendar um, for tracking kids' events. They might, in business, you might have something that you have events that you track, but you're not always a, a part of. It's a great way to keep uh, uh, track of them separately, but yet see them side by side. Um, the other thing that you can do is when you have two calendars selected, you can also then go into overlay. Now you can actually see the calendars on top of each other and color coordinated so that you can see, oh, I've got a wild game that I could go to because I've got time here on, on Tuesday at 7 o'clock. So it's just a nice way to overlay the calendars. That's a huge help. Um, and then you can just turn that off and right click it and turn the overlay off and do them side by side. Uh, we're going to go back to email. I know we've kind of jumped into the calendar and then back, but that's for a reason. I'm um, going to go back into uh, the mail, um, and we're going to get into uh, uh, search folders um, and how to use search folders. They're a little bit different than the views in that um, the search folders can search across multiple folders where the views are across a single folder. So to get the search folders, you go down here and go to search folders, right click and say new search folder. So I might, um, I'm going to always, I always start from a completely custom search folder because I like to specify all my criteria. So I'm going to choose, I'm going to call this one Gerald. I'm going to keep using him as a, an example. So I'm going to go into Gerald here and um, I'm going to say anything that's from Gerald. Click OK. And I'm going to include everything in my mailbox and all subfolders. So now what's going to happen here is you'll see that it's arranged by folder. I can actually change that and arrange by date. And it takes a little bit of while to build that search folder the first time. But it's just a snapshot of all Gerald's emails, whether it's in my tech, whether it's in personal, whether it's in sent item. Um, and you'll see, if I actually expand this over a little bit so you can actually see the folder, you can see here that it's in folder my tech. So you can see Gerald used to work for Synergy, and so we had a lot of things in Synergy, and now they're in my tech. And what we'll find is that Obviously, there won't be any sent items because I haven't, uh, well, here's one from Gerald in my sent items. So you'll see it shows up some in my inbox, some in my deleted items. And if I were to delete this item or move it to another mailbox, it'll only update it. it so if I delete this email right here, delete that, you'll see that it didn't delete it. It just changed it to the deleted items folder. So it's it's really just an organization of the mail, and you'll see that that's where it just updates it. And furthermore, if I delete this folder, it's going to say I'm going to permanently delete the search folder, but the items will not be deleted because it's just a snapshot of all the emails. So I might take this and throw this up into my, um, my favorites as well. So now, if I've got a project I'm working on with Gerald and it's really important that I see all the emails from him, it doesn't matter where they are. I can just come right here and now I can see all emails from him no matter where they are in any folder. So it's a really nice, quick, easy way to be able to find email. So I'm going to go ahead and delete this folder. And I haven't deleted any mail. So the other thing that search folders can do is help you organize your mail. So as you can see here, I have a large email folder, and I went into the properties of this. Oops, I'm sorry. Not properties. Customize the search folder. Here's the criteria. And I changed this to show mail greater than 2 megabytes, 2,000K. And uh, yes, for the people out there that are a little bit more technical, that's not exact. Um, but 
2,000 is an easy number to, uh, to type in and remember. So 2,000 equals 2 meg, good enough. So as you'll see here, um, I've got a lot of emails that are greater than 2 meg, but only 327. If I go through and I clean up my email starting from the top, deleting this one email in here, um, this presentation, I don't need this anymore. I'm done with this. I can delete that email because it was 13 meg or 15 megabytes. That was the equivalent of deleting about 100 and, um, 1,500 to 5,000 messages one by one, depending on the size. So this is where you want to spend your time to keep your mailbox clean. Doing this once a week, once a month will actually keep your mailbox down with less time and, and make your mailbox much smaller than going through one by one and trying to delete your mail as they come in. Just go to your large mail, start on the largest file and move down. And the things that are um, important to you, you'll keep them. So like this one, I don't need this anymore. This was a, a joke that went around the office. I can clean, clean it up, delete it, it's gone. I don't need to worry about that anymore. And I don't need this one anymore. So. I, as you can see, deleting four or five messages in here will be more than spending five or 6,000 messages in other folders. So great way to clean up your mailbox if your IT department is, is push pressure you to keep your mailbox small. Um, I have email in here since 1998, and I have every email communication between customers everywhere. And my mailbox, I don't get pressured from my IT department to uh, clean up my mail because I just come in here and clean it up here, and I'm able to keep those small messages. The other thing I might want to do is I might want to go to a message and just delete the attachments because I don't need this anymore, this attachment anymore. I can just remove the attachment and then keep the email, and I've done the same, essentially the same thing. So she had the year-end statement in there and this huge PDF document. I don't need that anymore. I was able to delete the attachment, and now I've cleaned up a 13 meg file. But the email is still there. So um, the next thing we're going to do is move on to advanced find, um, which is a nice way to look for documents. Everybody can search within this folder here. But when you click on the search tool, you'll see that up here comes search tools. Go to the advanced find. This is a great way. I'm going to show you my, uh, there you go. So I'm going to search for the word um, Gerald, but I'm not going to look in just the subject. I'm going to go in the subject, the message body, everything, any email that has the word Gerald in it. I'm going to click up here, browse. I'm going to search my entire mailbox and all subfolders, and then I'm going to hit find now. And what it's going to do is just going to go everywhere and start searching for the word Gerald in every single email everywhere. And you can see that came up very quick. I'm able to find something. Um, the advantage of using this advanced find feature is you're using your Exchange server's power. You're using your Exchange server's power to actually perform the search rather than your local uh, index copy on your computer, which is going to be much, much, much faster. The next thing I'd like to talk about is, um, is signatures. Um, signatures are um, a way to you know, sign the message, and everybody's used to using them. But I have a way that's very efficient. So when I click a new message, when I click and when I open up a new message here, um, you'll see that it automatically popped up my signature for my text. If I right click, I can actually change this to a reply message. And the nice thing about this is if I'm sending an internal message to my staff um, or I'm sending a message reply back to somebody, um, I can change it quickly and get the, all the graphics moved out, keep the email nice and small, um, and then also um, uh, being, making it so that um, my customers don't have to you know, see my logos and my, uh, 
all my signature stuff all the time. I just nice, tight, concise uh, reply. Um, I always put my phone number on here, and I put it in a format uh, of, uh, of you know, standard format for phone numbers, not the, the fancy marketing way with putting periods in there or other types of formats, because people with tablets, cell phones, um, and mobile devices can literally just click on that, uh, click on that number and give me a call. So I always make sure my phone number is always at the bottom of every email to make it easy for them to contact me. So how do I set that up? I go up into signatures up here, and I create my main uh, signature and edit it here. And you'll see that under new messages, I set my my tech. On reply messages, I set my reply message. And then I can have another message too. So because Synergy was acquired by my tech, I still do some Synergy business. Um, and so when that happens and I need to send a Synergy email, I can right click and now I have Synergy. So maybe your company has um, brands. I have a customer that has uh, three or four brands within a single corporate entity and they want to be able to send messages with different branding. Um, this is a great way to do it so it's super easy to change them out there. It, it takes no time at all and uh, uh, it's great. The other thing that's important too, when you're creating a signature, so many people will just go out and grab a logo and make that email, you know, that logo will just grab it off the website or they'll grab it off some marketing materials and they'll post it down there. And this logo ends up being two or three hundred uh, K. Every time you send a message, it saves it in your sent items, it stores it. Every time your customer or your vendor receives that, um, they're storing it on their email server. Everybody's paying to back it up. It just gets to be really expensive um, when you're not paying attention to the size of your graphics. So make sure your graphics are nice and small. I think in all of our graphics now, I think they're under um, 10K for an entire email. So if I were to email this to myself, you'll see that it's actually a very, um, very small uh, um, file. You'll see, okay, it's 32K. That's for the message and for all the, uh, the graphics and everything. So it's nice and small. Whereas you'll see some other people sometimes tend to be in the 200, 300K, and it's very, um, you just want to keep that as small as possible. Um, we're going to work, go into rules now. Um, I will tell you that um, rules are cool, and a lot of people jump into the rules, and they once they find out they can do the rules, uh, they um, uh, will tend to create too many rules, and then they don't know what happened to their email. So what's really good is to have a very small, concise set of rules that manage your, your email for specific purposes and don't get into a situation where you have 100 rules where you're trying to manage your email. That will take you too much time and, and it'll be too confusing when you can't find an email because your rules are doing things. There's also a limit in Exchange uh, and Outlook on your rules. Uh, and once the rules reach a certain size, you won't be able to build any more. So definitely keep them small. So I had a situation while, while we were being acquired by MyTech where we were working with a company of Cogent. And because my assistant uh, had access to my inbox and my staff had access to my calendar, it was really important that if I had anything coming from Cogent or MyTech for those two or three months where we were in uh, an evaluation of each other's companies, that I handled those very carefully. So I created a rule that said, when Cogent, my tech, or growth partners came, uh, email came into the subject or body, move it to the Cogent folder. And that you'll see over here, I had a Cogent folder. So here's all my emails about that. I also was able to go to the security and set to everybody that had no access to that folder. So there was no chance that um, those emails would end up going into that folder. So they automatically went in here so that I was able to keep them out of my inbox. Uh, two reasons. Um, one, I have an open door policy in my company. I, my emails are sitting out like this all the time. So I just didn't want any chance of somebody coming in and uh, seeing a cogent email or something from my tech and uh, opening any suspicion. Of course, uh, now that uh, my tech has acquired Synergy, everybody knows and we're all excited and happy about that. And uh, uh, so it's not important that I do that anymore, so I was able to just turn those rules off. So um, the other thing that I have here is I created a rule for timesheets. Um, I used to be responsible for all the timesheets my staff. Um, 
our system would just notify me all the time about timesheets. I just moved them to the deleted items folder, and if I actually needed to go back and worry about them, I'd go in my deleted items folder and look at for the timesheets and that'll. Um, so I was automatically deleting things off the timesheets. Same thing with the invoices. If I had billing come from certain companies, I would redirect it to an employee because uh, they wouldn't update the. We tried to update that email for these two particular companies for a long time. They wouldn't update it, so we just forwarded it on to our accountant. So lots of different ways to create rules. Um, and you can really do anything you want with a rule. It, it, you can move messages if they're from somebody. You can flag them for follow-up. I always start on a blank rule, so apply rules on messages I receive. You can say if it's from a person, if there are specific words in the body. This is nice here. This is a message header. This is a great one. If you have um, uh, four or five emails that are being forwarded to you um, for employees who've left or you're taking over the responsibility of somebody and you want to kind of be able to determine where they're coming from, you could say specific words. So if I want to find out if an email is still coming into my DMOIR at Synergy Services, I can actually just type this here, add it in, and say, if it comes in from Synergy Services, I want to go ahead and flag it. And I can change that to a follow-up, or I can just um, no response necessary. So I can just flag that message so I can actually see messages that are coming in that are specifically coming in to the bmoyer at synergyservices.com. Um, somebody might have a name change, they get married. That's another great way is you might want to turn off that old email address after a while because you got spam coming in there. It's a great way to actually flag a message or move it to a folder. If it comes in um, uh, on your old name, then you can determine if it's actually being used or not. So rules are very, very powerful. Once again, though, don't create too many because you, you've got to you know, keep track of what's actually going on. Uh, another thing about nice about rules, you can turn them on or off at will. So you might have a rule that you set up for a project with a specific customer that you only work with about once or twice a year. You can then just turn on that rule for that period that you're working with them and then turn it off when you don't want to have them go to that folder anymore. Um, the next thing we're going to do is go into the out of office. Um, we are um, out of office is something that is underutilized um, and uh, something that is very, very uh, powerful. So we're going to go into the um, under here under automatic, I went under file, automatic replies. So what's going to happen here is you, typical um, out of office, everybody's used to seeing them. You can go ahead and send the autom automatic replies, set your message to, for out of office. Microsoft has done this now for a few, uh, a few versions, and I really like it. You could have a different message for inside your organization and outside your organization. This is important because outside your organization, they're going to get this message no matter who they are. And so I might have specific instructions inside my office saying, hey, uh, contact Sam because um, I'm going to be out of the office. I'm going to be on vacation. Here's where I'm going. Um, give lots of information for inside. But if it's to the outside, I don't want to necessarily tell everybody and their mother where I'm going and when I'm going to be back. Um, just because um, you know, from a security standpoint, if people know that I'm on vacation, my house is now you know, available to be robbed. You know, so it's just it's one of those things where send your message to the outside, be a little bit more vague, and then uh, do a, a, a more custom message to you inside your organization. There is a new feature, though, that you can actually say if they're a contact of yours that you'll send them an out-of-office assistant, whereas if they're anybody else, they're just not going to get any message back. So that is another way to limit that um, as well. So if they're in your contacts, they'll get a nice uh, custom message. The other thing that I like is this only send during this range. Definitely use this. You know you're going to be gone. So I know that I'm going to be gone next week um, from the 27th, and I won't be back until the um, I turn it off on the 30th. Actually, I'll make turn off 29th at 5 p.m. So now I will get this message out, and anybody that's going to be gone, I can schedule this two, three days before my vacation. I don't have to remember to come and turn this on. 
I don't have to remember to turn it off. I can't count how many times people have been in the office for three, four days, and they're still sending automatic uh, office replies out. So you can actually schedule this when you're, when you're thinking about your vacation. You can schedule it two weeks in advance. It will automatically come on, automatically go off. It's just a really nice, uh, nice feature. The next thing you can do is you can add some rules to this out of office, which is really uh, another great thing. So now I can actually forward all the method, all my emails that come in, I can forward them on to uh, Gerald, and he's going to take care of all my emails for me when I'm gone. Um, and uh, he doesn't, I don't have to give him access to my inbox, he'll just get copies. And then that rule will automatically get applied during that time, and the rule will get shut off when the out of office apply, reply uh, gets turned off as well. So it's a great way to. Um, take care of uh, uh, um, your inbox and manage it while you're gone. Okay, so we're, um, that's, that's kind of the, the, the quick and dirty of uh, some of the things that I've done um, to optimize my time. So I manage my inbox primarily with very small number of folders. Um, I use search folders to, to look at my large mail and manage that. I also use search folders when I'm working on a project uh, to build it to a, to a user or a certain type of work. And then I also go in and use views as a way to manage um, the views in a particular folder so that I can find them uh, very quickly. Uh, are there any questions, uh, uh, Nathan, that, w that have come in so far? Or do you have any questions uh, reg regarding Outlook before we jump into Word? Well, one of the questions I had was around, um, I, I've heard some competing, uh, when I've heard people speak on uh, Outlook rules, um, I've heard people say that you use a crazy number of rules because you should make a rule, if you, if you get an email from someone more than, you know, five times or something like that, that you should create a rule to manage it. So really where you're managing by exception, I guess. So if it's an automated email or a newsletter or something like that. You, you create a rule for those. Um, and you said, and, and I know from managing your email, everyone kind of has a slightly different way of doing it. Can you elaborate a little bit on your philosophy of why you choose to only use um, a, a subset of a, a smaller set of rules as opposed to, um, you know, leveraging more? Well, the reason I, I, I use a smaller number of rules, and I recommend that, is um, being that Obviously, we're a support company. Um, we, I've gotten so many requests where people say, I got this email, and they, they sent it, and I can't find it. And if you have 100 rules, and your rules are complex, people don't know what the rule is, and they can't conceivably think about every possible scenario. So they write a rule that might be too broad, and all of a sudden that mail is getting dumped into a folder or automatically being deleted and managed from that way. So I've just had people create too many rules and end up uh, getting themselves into trouble um, of not really understanding a rule that they created a long time ago. So sure. it's not that you can't create a lot of rules. It's just that it's kind of keep yourself out of trouble. And a lot of times those rules are being uh, generated to put them into folders. And by using a search folder to find something because it's so fast and organized, a lot of times you don't, and using views and search folders kind of eliminates the need for organizing your mail on a folder basis. You know, another interesting point that you just, what, something you said reminded me is that one of the other challenges that I've heard about people using a lot of rules is that typically they're, they're creating a rule to move an email to a subfolder. Well, that's great. However, the challenge is then if, uh, for those of you who use uh, smartphones, which is nearly everybody today, uh, the inbox is your primary view. It's a lot easier to see all your email in your Outlook view than when you're trying to access your email to your phone and trying to change yeah. and switch between folders. So that's, that was another thing I've heard about that. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, the search folders are so easy to generate quickly and change. The other thing is once you move a, an email to a folder and you organize it, you, can, you only have one level of search, right? If I put a Jiro email in a Jiro folder, um, it's in the Jiro folder. But if that email also has something to do with my tech and also has something to do with customer A, um, 
I'm, I'm going to have to know that that's a, in the Jira folder and not in the MyTech folder and not in the Customer A folder. Whereas if I build a search folder for Jira, a search folder for MyTech, and a search folder for Customer A, I'm going to find that email all three times because it's searching based on the content of the email rather than how I organized it. That's a great point. That's a great point. Sounds good. Well, thanks for, for the Outlook stuff. Let's, uh, let's see if we can hit on uh, the, the Word. Uh, okay. So this is actually moving pretty good, so I will actually get to spend a little bit more time in uh, Word. How much time do I have? Oh, we've got about nine minutes left. Oh, well, I guess I don't have a lot of time. <laughs> All right, we'll get into Word. <laughs> Okay, so now that we're in Word, we're going to do some uh, very basic uh, formatting things. I'm just going to tab into my Word here. Uh, we're going to talk about tabs. Um, tabs are the most underutilized uh, formatting style of, uh, of Word, and so many people will type some information. They'll tab, tab, tab across. They'll type in a dollar amount. They'll hit enter. They'll type in some information. They'll tab across, you know, space over and they'll try to you know, line things up and make sure that you know, they'll put spaces over here until they kind of line them up. Um, if you're in the audience right now laughing because you're the one that does this, uh, don't feel bad. I see so many people do this on a, day, on a regular basis. Um, the easiest way to do it is, first of all, get your view, turn on your ruler. Um, I don't know why that's not a default setting in Word. It should be. Turn on the ruler because you'll get to see your tabs. I can come in here, literally select all of my items, click a tab stop, and then go in and delete all the extra tabs that I don't need, and tab once, and now everything is perfectly aligned. And I can keep typing in a whole both tab settings. The beauty of that is, is now if I select it and want to move that tab to a different spot, I can move it. I can also double click that. And for that first tab setting, I can go in and make that a decimal tab so that they line up. I can put some leader dots in there and click OK, and we're good to go. So now if I actually change any of this information and make it a, a, um, a dollar amount, you'll see that it's automatically lining up all the decimals. And then if I'm making changes to the text, you'll see that everything um, is, stays perfectly aligned. And then if I want to take the whole thing and kind of reorganize this, it's very easy to do and move it around. So that's all I'm going to spend on tabs. I just want to show that, that it's so easy to, to manipulate your tabs um, and be able to make an, a document that's nice and formatted. It's very easy to use. Um, it's spend, spend 15, 20 minutes trying to learn tabs and get, get them figured out to where you, you know, if I want to add as you can see, I added the left tab up here. I can just tab to the next spot, and now I can actually use that for typing notes. And it's all nice and aligned. And if I want to take that, select the entire area, and I can move that, move this back. Just it makes it for nice formatting documents. So the next thing I'm going to talk about is the outline view. The outline view is a great way to compile thoughts. Um, completely unorganized. If you're like me, the thoughts come at random. They're completely unorganized. It's how I built this agenda for the Word and Outlook. Uh, I started thinking of Word ideas and Outlook ideas. So I can literally say Outlook and Word. And then I can come up here and insert another one. Oops. And under Outlook, I'm going to type Favorites. And then up here, I literally can just expand it in like that and then come back down here and move this one back. So now these are high level. And then this is a subtitle. And I now can just keep going in here. And so forth. What's nice about this is once I'm in the outline view, I can close the outline view, and now it's built my, my structure. So now I can come in here and start typing things at every, every, every level. And it will, oops.
and it's going to keep that formatted. And then if I come in here and actually insert a page break and start that off, if I come back to the outline view, it keeps it all organized for me, and I can actually take entire sections and rearrange them. And when I do that, I go back. It's been rearranged for me in the document. Why is this important? Um, because instead of taking the typical document and having to manually select everything and go up here and pick a font, I can actually go in and change a heading, or I can come in and change a style. So if I go into style sheet, style sets here, you'll see that my whole document is following a standard automatically. So if I go to this format, you'll see that it's, everything follows that format precisely. And the benefits of that is now if I go to review, I, I'm sorry, not review, references, I can go up to the table of contents and I can automatically build, insert a table of contents. And because everything is based on the outline view, it automatically built it and it will update it if I actually come in here and insert a, another page break. I can then come in here and update the field and it will automatically update the page numbers for the document. So by using the outline view, starting with the outline view, I can gather my thoughts, I can then use my style sheet to then format my document. Um, so what I highly recommend is you can also build a custom style sheet. So you can come in and change the heading document. You can modify this. And you can say, my, my heading, I want it to be much larger and it will adjust it everywhere, everywhere in the document. And if I like this heading to actually look like that and be a different color, I can do that as well, and it'll update the entire document. Then I can go in there and set that to the default, or I can come in and change that as a, save that as a new style, as a new style. So you can build styles for your organization so that everybody, when they're doing documents, are very, very consistent. Um, that's all I had wanted to show you in Outlook. Um, using style sheets, tab documents, and an outline view for, uh, for generating your documents, using those three things, um, you're going to go from a very basic level of formatting Word documents to a uh, near professional look. Um, I can still tell you that today I still get Word documents that people are not doing that with. And so if you do those three things, you'll be an expert in Word. People will think you know everything. So, and I promised I'd show you how to get the help. F1 in your keyboard always brings up help. Amazingly enough, Word and Office help are helpful. You can just type in how to do a mail merge, and you're literally going to get how to do it and you're going to see articles, you're going to see videos, you're going to see um, third-party uh, lessons. Uh, it's, it's fantastic. Um, the help is helpful. Definitely use that. So if anything I covered today and I, didn't, I went over it too fast, um, you can literally just type in how to use tabs, how to use search folders, and I guarantee you you're going to find it in the help section of Word. Um, not too many applications are that good, but in, in these documents they are. So I know we only have like uh, a minute or two here. So any any questions related to Word, uh, uh, Nathan? No, not at this time. There are no questions that came in. But I, I would like to reiterate that what you were saying there, Ben, is that there are actually, in recent uh, years, there have been lots of videos and third-party videos, uh, YouTube videos on the Microsoft site. There's a lot of training videos that are simple, simple training items that um, you can leverage online. Um, to kind of literally walk you through all these different components uh, and, and more that we didn't uh, obviously have time to cover today. The other thing I do want to remind everyone online is that uh, this is this session was recorded and it will be posted to our website within the next 24 to 48 hours uh, once we get it uh, uh, compressed and uploaded. 
Um, so you can always review it at a later date. So at this time, it's 12 noon. We've hit our hard stop. I want to thank everyone who has been paying, who has been watching online, participated online, as well as who'll be watching this in the future. And thank you, Ben, for uh, guiding us through tips and tricks on uh, Outlook and Word. Thank you very much, everyone, and uh, have a great thank day. Thank you.